will be listening. So Bria is going to read our passage for the day. So if you want to open your Bibles to um, Matthew 19 uh, through 21, I hope Matthew 6, 19 through 21, and uh, then she'll pray for our service after that, okay? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day and this opportunity to talk to the congregation about a different way to serve you, and I just ask that you speak to each and every one of the members in this church today, both in person and live through Tom's sermon, and that you just give us a sense of peace and what we're supposed to do with our ministry, our faith, our service next. And Lord, I just thank you for this day. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bria. So yes, you figured it out. We are starting a stewardship series. I know it's uh, your favorite topic every year. This is what you look forward to, and inevitably this is the week that you will have invited somebody new or convinced a family member to, to join us here, and here we are talking about money and Oh, it figures. So I would say that I'm sorry, but, uh, well, I'm not. So, uh, I don't know, let's see, a little awkward silence. <laughs> but we got that part out of the way. But honestly, I'm hopeful that this will be a series that will convince you to not just give more money. It's not about giving more money, but honestly about giving more of yourself to God you see, it is said that you can tell where someone is in their walk with God by looking at their date book and their checkbook. And yes, a date book is a thing. I, that's what it used to be called 100 years ago. Um, but that's how you can tell where somebody is in their walk with God. It's how have they dedicated their time and their money to him. We were blessed to get to hear from Gary and Terry who have dedicated over 20 years of their lives to take in the good news to Mexico. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what is God calling us to do? Where is God calling us to give? So the first thing we need to do is we need to prioritize God. In Matthew chapter 6, Bria read for us that Jesus' um, call to not store up treasures here on earth. And why not? Because your treasure here on earth is temporary. It will simply be destroyed by moths and rust. Ultimately, what you hoard here on earth is meaningless. The old saying that he who dies with the most toys wins, it's foolishness. So what should we do? Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, which last for an eternity. How often do we really think in this way? I don't know about you, but I spend way too much time thinking about how much I have in my savings account, if I'm saving enough for retirement, you know, all those financial things about me, me, me. Jesus says this isn't the way it should be. John Wesley lived into this call of Jesus to not store up things here on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven. John Wesley gave almost all of his money. John Wesley learned that he could live on 28 pounds a week. So when he was making 30 pounds, or 28 pounds a year, I think it was actually. So when he was making 30 pounds he gave two pounds, and he lived on the 28 pounds. The next year, his income doubled to where he was making 60 pounds, but he still lived on the 28 pounds, and he gave all the rest of it. And that went on a couple times. At the end of John Wesley's life, literally the only thing he had was the change in his pocket. John Wesley lived out this principle. 
that we are not to store up treasures here on earth, but treasures in heaven. And there's more to just giving ourselves to God than just our finances. There's more of just giving ourselves to God than our finances. This morning, instead of reading the, reciting the Apostles' Creed, we, we uh, recited the Shema. That's Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9. It's the Shema, which means to hear, which is the first word in that passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. In that passage, Moses writes that we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. Now, when Moses talks about our heart, the word he uses is le, le vava, I think is how it's pronounced, which is weird because it has bees in it. But um, I think it's le vava, which means the inner man or the mind or the will or understanding Moberly, who wrote a book on the Old Testament, says that this word more accurately means the seat of one's thoughts, which to me seems like it should be translated as as mind. So love God with your mind and your, your will. Moses also says, love God with all your soul, which oddly enough, again, in our culture, the world, the word for soul, nefesh, would probably be more accurately translated as heart. So same thing, they just, it's maybe backwards, but I don't know Hebrew, so I'm just reading other people. So, um, but that word nefesh means the seat of emotions and desires. And, and in our culture, the seat of our emotion, our desires, is our heart. So love the Lord your God with all your thoughts, with all your will, with your emotions. And finally, that third part, love the Lord your God with all your strength. Now this is the one that to me means the most. This is the one where I don't say strength, I say might. And some of the different uh, um, translations have might, including the NASB, which uses might. You see, in the NAV, we read the word strength, but to me, strength means a physical strength, like a physical aspect, like use all of your muscle, all of your physical ability to honor God. But a better translation of the Hebrew word mihod is might because it means all that you've got. When a king goes out to battle an enemy and he he goes at him with all of his might, what does that mean? It means he's going to send out all of his resources against that enemy. He's going to send out all of his men, his weapons, his finances. Everything he has is going to be used to combat that enemy. That's what that word mihod means. It's all of us, all of our might. So we are called to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our might. And interestingly enough, though, the key word in the passage here is not any of those ways that we are to love God. It's not the heart, it's not the soul, it's not the might, but love. Love is the key word in this passage. Love the Lord your God. And this is how we love the Lord. David Guzak writes, what God wants most from us is our love. We often think God demands a hundred other things from us, our money, our time, our effort, our will, our submission, and so forth. But what God really wants from us is our love. This will probably sound silly, but last night, uh, well, Jessica had made me anniversary cookies. So last this week, we had our anniversary. And for our anniversaries and for my birthday, she makes me these special cookies. They're strawberry chocolate chip cookies. I love these cookies. Now, in the past, I may or may not have not shared those cookies. So I would share a little bit of them, but then the rest I hoarded for myself. As I'm doing this sermon this week and really thinking about that loving others and loving God, I thought, you know what? Yeah, I love these cookies. 
but I actually love my kids more than I love these cookies. So after dinner, we had dessert, and they got to have more cookies. You see, it was love that led me to share those cookies, and Jessica got some too. I, didn't, I don't just love the kids. <laughs> so we all had cookies for dessert. You see, and when we really love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and might, then everything else is freely given to God. If we give the Lord all the rest, our, our time, money, effort, will, and so forth, without giving him our love, it's all wasted. And perhaps it is all lost. It's meaningless. God wants a complete love from us. This love is appropriate because he loves us completely. Perhaps for many of you, money is, is not the issue. Giving your money is not the issue. You're generous and you tithe with a, a cheerful heart, etc. Perhaps for you, the area that you need to give over, that you're really struggling with, is your time. Maybe it's your spiritual gifts. Maybe God has blessed you in certain ways and he's calling you to use these gifts and you just haven't started using those yet. You've been hoarding them for yourselves. Maybe you are struggling to be a good steward or, or struggling, you sharing those abilities. See, God must take priority, top priority, in every area of our lives. And when God takes top priority in our lives, every other area gets polarized. It will reveal what in our lives, when we give God that top priority, it will reveal what in our lives takes our focus away from God and what draws our focus to God. I forgot my magnets this morning. Polarized in the, uh, in the dictionary is defined as breaking up in opposing fra fractions, factions or groupings. And it was funny to me that the example sentence the dictionary used for this word was that they ran a campaign that polarized the electorate. If there's anything politics has taught us over the last several years is how polarizing a candidate or a party can be. But polarization isn't necessarily a bad thing. Here's where I was supposed to have my kids' magnets to show you. Yeah, but you've all seen it. Sometimes they stick. If you turn it around, they don't stick, right? Um, but I'm sorry, I, I missed that object um, opportunity. When a magnet is polarized, it has a north end and a south end. Therefore, one side is negative, the other side is positive. When two north poles are pointed at each other, they repel each other, and you can't get them to, to hook, right? When we have an idol in our life, something that we have put in the place of God or prioritized over God, then God will be repelled from our life in that same way. Now, God may not leave completely, just as we can hold those magnets together somewhat, but it will always be a battle, a struggle. But when we have God in his rightful place, as let's say the North Pole, and we ourselves recognize that we are second to him, and we take on that South Pole role, then we will be in full connection with the Father. Much of what we set up as idols which repel God, they, they aren't bad things in and of themselves. They are made harmful to us when we elevate them to an ungodly position, when we give them the wrong pole, the wrong order. We got, a, we got to test this theory last Monday night at our young adult meeting as uh, it was the Bills game Monday night. But uh, the young adults all still showed up, and we sat and we had our conversation, and we went late, and um, I will say at least one of our young adults was in Bill's attire, probably wanted to get home and see the game, but they were late. They didn't get to see the beginning of it. It didn't stop them from still placing as a priority in their life this time of fellowship, this time of studying God's words. Now, this Monday night will be the real challenge for me because it's the Seahawks playing, so we'll see how fast I talk um, during our lesson time. But sports in and of themselves are not bad, 
but what priority are we given to sports? And parents, this may be a question for you guys now, or maybe it's going to be. I'm, I'm, uh, I know that I'm going to wrestle with this at some point. I'm praying that when the day comes and my kids want to play sports, that I will be able to continue to stand strong and prioritize God and his church over sports. It amazes me how many practices and games are on Sundays now. Why? Because the church hasn't stood up and said no. Are we going to prioritize God and the church over even sports? And I pray that when my kids are older that I will be able to be strong in that way. And in the same way, money, going back to money, isn't bad in and of itself. But what priority are we giving to our money? In our passage today, Jesus talked about how our treasure, the stuff that matters the most to us, should be in God's kingdom and not on this earth. And he ended by saying really clearly that you cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You, friends, you and I, we cannot serve both God and money. We cannot serve both God and ourselves. Jesus is saying here that money and God both are demanding our worship, and we must prioritize one or the other. Gavit Bennett said that in John 15, Jesus tells his disciples that the greatest love someone can have is to lay down their life for their friends. And so here is another principle of generosity I'd like to offer you. The question of generosity of our giving is not how much must I give, but how much do I believe that God has given me? I will be as free with my money in as much as I have allowed God to set me free As C.S. Lewis says, one of the dangers of having a lot of money is that you may be quite satisfied with the kinds of happiness that money can give and therefore fail to realize your need for God. Am I worshiping what I've been given or am I worshiping the giver? How many of us are denying God the gift of giving us our daily bread that we pray for because we don't actually need it? I remember when we were in Cuba, one of the big things that we recognized there was that when they pray, give us this day our daily bread, they meant that prayer. Because each day was a where is the next meal coming from? To prioritize God, we must ask ourselves, what do we need to deprioritize? So what are we trying to put in the place of God? And then once we have figured out what we need to deprioritize, we have to purge the unnecessary things in our lives. My encouragement for you this week is to spend time with God, asking him, what areas of my life have I given over? Have I allowed to become What areas of my life have I allowed to take that place of God? In what areas am I prioritizing other things over God? And let's figure out what we need to purge so that we really can have a right relationship with the Father. For me, I've got several areas. And I'm just going to be honest with you guys, as I always am. Games. I get distracted on my phone. And I think six or seven months ago, I told you that this was an issue for me. And a few weeks later, I put one back on my phone. And this week, I had to take it off again. Maybe it was last week. So it was in the last week or two. Because I was spending way too much time sitting and playing this dumb game. It had taken over a role in my life that I didn't want it to have. TV, I'm still working on this. Every night we like to sit down when the kids are finally in bed and we can just sit and veg. We just turn on the TV and we keep talking about we need to do something different. (laughs) But we're struggling with that. It's an area we need to purge. And money. 
like I said, I still think about if something happened, do we have enough? Would we be able to take care of it? Instead of saying, you know what? Are we given enough? And trusting that if something happens, God will take care of us. This is an area where I still need to grow. I still need to purge some of these things. And to purge these things from our lives, it takes more than just willpower. It also takes surrounding ourselves with like-minded believers who will help us, who will pray for us, who will hold us accountable. I share these things up here because I know that if I just keep these things to myself, it's never going to change. Once you realize what areas of your life that you need to surrender that are holding you back from right relationship with God, share those things and purge them from your life. So this week, I encourage you to start with that first step. Pray and listen for God to reveal what areas you need to change or surrender to him. And over the next two weeks, we're going to have two more challenges for you. But let's start with step one. Simply prayer. Pray and listen. Listen for God to speak. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. And I thank you for all that you're doing. Help us, Father, to recognize any areas in our lives that we need to give over to you, that we need to surrender to you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray um, for our church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways that you've provided for us, that we have the opportunity to give back to you. We know that you take care of us. Thank you for the ways that you've provided for this church. Continue to provide that we can continue to build your kingdom here in our little corner of the world. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you're doing and will do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friend, the takeaway from today, friends, each day you must choose to put God first. Are you making this choice? This week, may God give you the wisdom to know the right, the courage to choose it, and the strength to endure. Amen.